Everybody's talking about it, yet very few people really understand it. And what am I referring to? Weather or meteorology. Now, when you go to teach weather to your students, it's important that you start with a basic ingredient, the primary ingredient without which there would be no weather, and that ingredient is air. Once we understand, of utmost importance, that air is matter, it has weight, and it takes up space, then we can go ahead and do experiments with air, look at the characteristics of air, how air behaves under certain conditions. For example, how much water will it hold? What is the temperature of the air? How does that affect it? As we build this idea, the behavior of air, into a model, we start to understand weather and principles of weather, and it builds upon itself. So let us now start at the basic level and show that air is matter. Before you even introduce the idea of air and what air is, show them a physical model like this. A little animal, and I have a little gorilla down here, and a jar filled with jelly beans. Now, we're going to ask our students what it would be like to be this little gorilla down here at the bottom with all these jelly beans pushing down upon us. And then we're going to ask them what it would be like if we had a jar twice the size and it was filled with jelly beans. In other words, we had twice as many jelly beans pushing down upon us. We'd be carrying this awful weight of jelly beans around on our shoulders. And what would it be like to be one of these jelly beans in the bottom with all the other jelly beans on top of you? Or compare it to one of the jelly beans on the top. And then you make a transition from the physical model of the atmosphere to the real model of the atmosphere. And we're nothing more than like this little gorilla down here walking along the bottom of a seafloor with all these molecules of air pushing down upon us. They're not as big as jelly beans. In fact, they're so small we can't see them. And there's so much space between them that it looks like they're transparent. And we can see through them. But they do exist. They're there. And as we go higher up in our atmosphere, on top of mountains, there's less weight of these little particles pushing down upon us. This is a primary understanding of air and the atmosphere. Now we want to go on one step further and look at the fact that air has weight and takes up space. It's important to develop physical models whenever we try and teach these concepts. We're going to deal first with the question, does air take up space? And you're going to use your aquarium. I hope you have an empty aquarium laying around. It's important to have one. There's so many activities you can do with these. Take a glass of air and ask your students if all these little particles are packed in here and you pushed it upside down and you put it down into the water, could the water come up and take the place of the air? Would it compress the air a little bit? Would it come halfway up? What do they think would happen? Have a student do it and use a little crayon or something that floats in the water so that you can see where the water level is when the student lowers the glass down. Very quickly, the students will realize that the air in that glass is taking up space, and it's pushing back against the water and keeping it from rising up. Ask them what would happen if there was a tiny hole in the top of the cup so the air could escape. Maybe you want to try that as an activity. Another good activity while you have your tank and your water is to get two glasses and say, how would I pour air from one glass to another? You can't see it pouring this way, and in fact, it's not pouring because there's no density differences in the gases. But if one glass is completely filled with water and the other glass is completely filled with air, we can pour the air from one glass to the other in the water, and your students can actually see it pour, and you want to try and catch as much as you can. And after a while, all the air that was in here is now gone and it's filled with water and all the water has been pushed out and now filled with air and you can test it to see that it's still air there by floating your little crayon again down at the bottom. If you want to reinforce these ideas further you can try a few activities with plastic bags which we'll look at next. Now for the famous bag experiments. You can ask your students which bag has more air, the big one or the little one. You can have them get to feel for air pressure. As air gets squished more and more and more, it puts out more force in return. And in fact, the force can sometimes be so great, it can burst the bag. 
you might want to try and have a student sit on one of these and just see what happens as that air pressure gets stronger and stronger from the weight pushing down on it. Another thing you can do is have them make these little gadgets, uh, a bag with a straw taped around it, and have them set it carefully under a book and blow into it and watch what happens. This is a principle that you can bring on to your students that we use the force of air to do work for us on certain occasions. And have you ever wondered why Rice Krispies go snap, crackle, and pop when you put the milk in? Well, they're nothing more than little bags of air. And when the milk touches them, the little bags get smaller and smaller and the air gets compressed, just like this model of a Rice Krispie. Bag experiments can be lots of fun, and I know you'll have a lot of fun with them yourself. There's ways to show that air has weight. And there's simple ways using a yardstick where you have an inflated balloon on one side and a deflated balloon on the other. But have you ever wondered just how many grams that air is? How much does it weigh? You have to have a good balance, a measuring device. And we cover operating this balance more in the physical science tape. Every school, every elementary school should have at least one good balance. What we're going to do is weigh the balloon without air first, and it appears to weigh 1.8 grams. Then we're going to blow the balloon up and weigh it again. Let's do that and see what it weighs. It's kind of precarious balancing this balloon on the beam so it doesn't blow off. You have to watch the air currents in your room. But once it's on there and you reweigh and you want to blow the balloon up as much as you can, get the most air in it you can, and a big balloon is best. I found that my balloon now weighs 2.2 grams, so the difference is four tenths of a gram. That's the weight of all this air, and it's under pressure, so there's a lot more air in here than you think. Now, four tenths of a gram is not a lot of weight for this much air, but we can measure it. And that's what's important, is being able to measure the weight of the air. And we can see that air indeed is very light for the amount of space it takes up. And this is an important basic concept for understanding density, and in particular, density of gases. Now let's continue to use balloons and play a little trick on our students and, and go along with another activity in density. Now you show your students two balloons, a medium one and a small one, and you say, which one do you think weighs the most? And if they got something from that last experiment, they'll say, the large one. But in fact, you've played a trick on them, you've filled this one with water, it's a water balloon. And right away they can see that one of them is very heavy compared to the other one. So you can start to see, and they can start to see, that liquids are much denser than gases. And a balloon full of water is much heavier than a larger balloon full of air. Let's go back to this previous model, the one with the gorilla. Remember him who's being crushed by all the jelly beans. And this time, extension. We want to talk about the particles. What are the particles in the air? And the students can see from this model that there's two main particles, the blue ones and the black ones. And there's more blue ones and black ones. The blue ones represent nitrogen, 80% of our air. And the black ones represent oxygen, a very important element for our survival. That's the other 20%. Now this model's good, but it doesn't explain everything we want to explain when we talk about air and how it behaves. So we need to go on to another air model. And you want to talk to your kids about what models are. They're things that represent what something is. It's not what the thing actually is. In other words, the air isn't really jelly beans. Our next model is going to be what I call the popcorn balloon model. And you use a funnel and you put a balloon on the end of it. And you fill the balloon, not fill it, but put a few popcorn kernels in. They'll drop down into the balloon. After you've got a few in one, you blow it up, and then you put more in the second and more in the third. So you have three different balloons with different amounts of popcorn in it. Now this is a model of different altitudes. This first sample was taken at a very high altitude from an airplane, way up 40,000 feet high. And you've brought back to the laboratory, and the students look inside and see how many particles of air are in there. Not very many. 
So the air from the very high altitudes doesn't have too many particles in it for this amount of space. The air from a mountaintop has more, and the air from sea level has even more. So this brings the idea across that there's denser air, more compressed air at sea level than there is up at altitude. The other importance of this model is that you can demonstrate that air is constantly moving. Little particles of air, little molecules of air constantly hitting us and bouncing off each other and bouncing around. And all you have to do is shake the balloon to demonstrate that. Now, when we study weather, this is very important because as we look at these particles, we want to see how they behave at different temperatures. Now, what do you think would happen to these little popcorn particles if they were heated up? Now, it's important to remember that these particles are bouncing around the whole time. You might have a student continue to shake them so that the rest of the class can realize that. And the question we want to ask is, what would happen to these particles if we started heating them up? And you can always ask your students, say, well, what would you do if somebody lit a candle under you? Well, the obvious answer is they'd go and bounce around even harder and faster and you can have the student pretend that they're being heated up and even bounce them harder. And then you ask the question, what would happen to the balloon if these particles were bouncing around harder and harder and banging against the wall harder and harder from the heat, the heat energy that's being put into them? And hopefully they'll say the balloon will get bigger or explode, but the, a good answer is get bigger. So now you want to ask the question, well, what about the space between each particle? each little popcorn kernel. If the balloon is bigger now, and they're still all flying around in there, is not the space between them also bigger? And hopefully you can get them to that conclusion, is that when you heat things up, the space between the molecules gets bigger. And the pressure will get greater, of course, in this balloon. And if you cool them down, the space will get smaller, the particles will get closer together, and the speed of the particles will slow down. Now let's take these ideas and make some predictions. The predictions to the outcome of a series of experiments. Everyone loves bubble soap, and here's an experiment to reinforce what we've just covered. This time we use a small can and a little bowl of bubble soap. Dip the can into the bubble soap so that you get a nice film of bubble soap along the top of the can. And then set the can in hot water. But before you do, ask your students what they think will happen. Your students should be able to visualize the little particles moving faster and faster and, and hitting the film, bubble film harder and harder and the space between them getting further apart. And then what would happen if we cooled it off again? We took the same uh, little bubble and put it in ice water. Well, just like you might expect, the bubble goes back flat and actually it'll go concave as the air cools down even more. Now that your students are getting a good idea about the behavior of air, let's pose a problem to them. You start with a bottle of cold air. The colder, the better. And you ask your students what they think will happen as this air heats up. And we're going to put a balloon over the top of the bottle. What will your students, what do they think will happen as we put it in this hot water? Now that we've got a bottle of hot air, let's go one more step. Let's take the bottle of hot air out of the water, take the balloon off and let all the excess air out, and then put the balloon back on again. And now ask your students what they think will happen as this air cools. And if you want to see more obvious results, put it in a refrigerator. We're back with another bottle of air and it should be as cold as possible. Get the top of the bottle wet, wet a penny and set it on top. You want to have a good seal of the penny on top of the bottle. And then have your students just watch it to see what happens. If you put your hands around the bottle and warm it quicker, you may get faster reaction. We can't stop now. We're on a roll. Now we're going to talk about temperature and how we define temperature. Think of those little particles bouncing around again. Here's a bag of cold air and a bag of warm air. And when you look at the little thermometer inside, you see that the mercury's higher in the warm air. Why? 
Well, use your particle theory. All the little warm particles are bouncing around real hard in here and they're hitting the glass and they're making the little particles in the glass bounce around faster and they in turn are hitting the liquid in the thermometer and making them move faster and as they move faster they get further apart and expand. We're talking about expansions of solids and liquids and gases all at once in here. In our bag of cold air, the particles aren't moving as fast. And of course, the little mercury thermometer is not going up as high. It's a good explanation. And in fact, what you're teaching is what we call molecular kinetic theory. Now, don't let those big words scare you. They mean very little. Because teaching science is not naming big words, but rather explaining what we see around us in the simplest terms. Take wind, for example. People ask what wind is, and the best answer is, wind is moving air. But what do you say when the inquisitive student says, well, what makes the air move? How do you explain that? Don't despair, we have a model for everything. And this is our model of the wind. And all you need is a balloon. And you want to get the idea across that there's a lot of air compressed in this little balloon. Have them try and think about how many breaths it took to fill a balloon like this up. There's a lot of air in here that's compressed. The particles are pushed closer together and it's the skin of the balloon that's pushing down on them. The force of the elastic surface of the balloon. Now we want to ask the next question. When the air, when the end of the balloon is opened up, which way will the air go? Will the air inside the balloon that's under pressure come shooting out? Or will the air outside of the balloon that's not under pressure go shooting in? Now it sounds like a very simple question, but sometimes you actually have to let the air out so that they can see that the air under pressure has a tendency to go toward the air that's not under pressure. And this is what causes our winds. There's high pressures and low pressures throughout the world. And the wind always travels from the high pressure to the low pressure. Are you still not convinced and you want more evidence? OK, well, let's take a look at model number two. In model number two, we're using two plastic bags this time connected with a straw. And before you connect this bag, blow some air into the first one. Now here's our model a bag with air, and there's no external force pushing down in this air except for the atmosphere itself, but there's no elastic surface like the balloon had, so this air is just sitting here. And the first question we ask is, if this just sits here, will this air eventually flow into this bag? Now, if this bag is light enough, there's no weight pushing down on it. It shouldn't, or it should flow very slowly. You can observe it for a while to see. Next question. What happens if this air gets put under pressure, which means that there's more air overlying it, pushing down on it? The air is denser in this particular area than it is over here. Well, we start putting force down in our bag and pushing on the air. And look at what happens. We cause a wind to flow. The wind from the high pressure that goes toward the low pressure. And in this case, the wind is flowing through the straw. Of course, if there were no air, there would be no wind. Now, it's sometimes difficult for students to visualize wind blowing through the straw. So you need to expand it. You need to have wind in your classroom. And unless you have a good natural draft, you may have to resort to one of these, the fan. And you can use little simple wind measuring devices to check wind direction. These are called wind vanes. This one's made with paper taped onto a straw with a paper clip on one end for balance and a pin holding it to a pencil. Another wind vane different model is a nail driven into a piece of wood with another piece of straw and this time an aluminum vein taped onto it. Now whatever model you use, you're going to need to have a compass to measure the direction the wind is coming from. That's always the direction we measure. And the way to use it is to set it so the red needle points directly to the north and then the direction that your wind vane is pointing to will be the direction of the wind. In this particular case we would have an east wind. You can go ahead and turn your fan on and have your kids make the measurements, and then you can have them go outside and measure the real wind. You can measure the wind every day, the wind direction. If you want to get more advanced and measure wind speed, there's a very simple device that you can buy from a science supply house. And this one just blows air across the top and makes this little ball fly up in the air. Let's demonstrate it. Now, keeping all this in mind, let's take a look at water. 
Water, as we know, exists in three states, solid, liquid, and gas. When water is a solid, all the little particles, all the little water molecules are connected together. They can't move around. It's like two molecules connected with a popsicle stick. They're locked together and they're interconnected. All they can do is vibrate in place, shake around in one spot. And you might to represent it in your classes, have your students all hold hands and just kind of shake in place to represent what a solid is doing. All the particles in a solid, they can't move around. As you start to put heat energy into this solid, little particles start to get hotter and hotter and shake harder and harder and eventually they break away from the connection and then they can just start kind of swimming around or crawling around each other like bees in a hive. This is what we've just done now is melt the solid and turn it into a liquid. This is what a liquid is. Every now and then one of these particles gets up enough energy and just goes flying out into space. And that little particle is just evaporated. Now, these particles can fly out in space from water at any temperature. In fact, they can even escape from ice. And if you've ever looked at old ice cubes in your freezer, you've seen them get smaller because they're actually evaporating. But as we know from our theory, that the more heat you put into a substance, the faster the particles go. We can very quickly understand that water will evaporate faster as it's heated. And where do these little water particles go when they get heated up and go flying off into space? Well, remember our model of air particles, the nitrogen and the oxygen, with all the space in between them. The water molecules just find that space and lodge themselves in there. Now, if the air is warm, there's more space between particles, therefore there's more room for water molecules. If the air is cold, there's not as much room. So cold air holds less water than warm air. Now we want to reinforce this idea, so one thing we might do is go back to our jelly bean model and get a different color jelly beans like red ones as I have here and intermix them with the blue and the black ones so that the students can realize that there's another thing now in air. And that particle is the water molecule. Now to go further into this idea, we want to actually capture some of these water molecules that are locked up in the air. All we have to do, as you might guess, is cool down the air and bring the air particles closer together and squeeze those little water molecules out. To cool the air down, we're just going to use a tomato juice can and pour some ice cold water into it. Make sure the outside of the tomato juice can is dry and free of water and right away you'll see a mist developing on the can. You can rub your finger across it and no notice it. As it sits longer, the little water droplets get bigger and bigger. And you can actually see where the water level is in this can. There's no mist up here and there is mist down here. This water is coming from the air that's closest to the outside of the can that's getting cooled. It is not coming through the can. This is water vapor that's condensing out into a liquid form and it's coming directly from the air. Let's now go one step further and take a look at what clouds are and how they're formed. We know these little water molecules are invisible. We can't see them. What then is a cloud? Well, as the air rises, it cools, and these little water particles turn into liquid. So what we have in a cloud is little tiny pieces of liquid water floating around together. They're so tiny that they don't fall to earth very fast. Some of them fall at about 40 feet per hour. And when they get closer to the earth, they evaporate and disappear in the air anyway. So they kind of just float around up there. There's many different kinds of clouds. If we want to show our students exactly what's happening, we set up a model like this. A bottle with some very hot water in it. I'm using boiling water. And it's important to preheat the bottle first to avoid it from cracking. Heat it with hot water, pour the hot water out, and then pour the boiling water in. Get a hot pad and shake it to clear it so that you can see in there. And then put an ice cube on top. The water vapor particles are going to rise up in the bottle and they're going to hit this cold air up at the top and condense out and form little particles, little cloud particles, almost like fog, swirling around in there. And it's difficult to see on camera, but when you're close to it looking at it, you can see thousands and hundreds of little raindrops falling inside here. So you have a little environment, a mini environment. And it's really very exciting. You'll see what I mean when you try it yourself. Now the ideal thing to do is to have your students go outside and identify and classify clouds. There's really ten names for different kinds of clouds, but we're only going to be concerned with the three major ones. Clouds are classified according to the altitude they're found at and the shape of the cloud. Up at the very top, 
we have the cirrus cloud and your students can make this as a model before they go out so they know what they're looking for. The cirrus clouds are the wispy clouds. They have kind of feathery wispy edges that curl around. These are found at 20 to 40,000 feet and they usually mean fair weather. What they are really are tiny particles of ice floating around at very high altitude. It's so cold up there. It's little water droplets that have turned to ice. The second type of cloud we want to look at that can be found at all altitudes is a stratus cloud. Stratus, as the name suggests, is the layered clouds. Now these clouds can go for miles in this direction and miles in that direction, but they're not very thick. And when they're down at the ground, we call them fog. And the third and final cloud we might look for is the cumulus cloud. The cumulus cloud has a flat bottom and a turret-shaped top, and it's a vertical cloud. It can go up in altitude for quite a distance. It looks much like a cauliflower. These clouds can turn into the thunderheads that cause our rain. Now, as we go out and identify these clouds, we can start recording the types of clouds we see each day and keeping it in our weather chart, which we're going to talk about next. Now, there's many different ways to keep track of the weather many different ways that you can have your students keep a weather chart. It's a must-do activity for any primary course in meteorology. The simplest weather chart is using symbols and pictures to characterize the daily weather, like umbrellas, or rain clouds, or sunshine. And as your students become more advanced, you want to give them more of a challenge. And one of the best ways to do this is have them make an advanced weather chart. This involves taking a thermometer outside, and every classroom should have at least one, and measuring the air temperature and recording the time that they measured it. And remember, this is measured in the shade. Use their wind vanes and go outside and measure the wind direction and uh, record that. And if you have a wind speed indicator, measure the wind speed. Go outside and look for clouds and try and identify which clouds are in the sky and record that information. We're gathering a lot of information from our observations and then we're communicating this information to the other students in the class. It doesn't take long to do this on a daily basis. It might take five minutes and you can have the the morning weather reading and it's it's great for scientific method because it starts to get these observational skills going. Now if you want to go even further you can measure the amount of humidity in the air by measuring the temperature of the water when the dew appears outside the can. Now how you do that is take tap water and throw an ice cube in it and have a student slowly stir it so the water is cooling down and cooling down and getting colder. And another student's looking at the side of the can and maybe rubbing his finger along it looking for moisture to appear. The moment he sees that first drop of moisture, you've reached the dew point and the first student reads the thermometer. And remember, keep the thermometer in the water when you read it. Record that temperature. Now, if the temperature's real cold, there's not a lot of water in the air. And if the temperature's real warm, there's a lot of water in the air. This is a measurement of relative humidity. You can really use your own imagination, your own creative ideas to measure things like rainfall, if you like. It's limitless when it comes to weather. And it's a really good experience in gathering, recording, and communicating data. Now we want to test the student's ability to think. And let's pose a couple problems to them. First problem, if you have a wet paper towel in the air and a wet paper towel that's sealed off in a plastic bag, which one will dry out first and why? See if they can put together that information that you just taught them to come up with a conclusion and then go ahead and do the experiment and see what happens. Another fun one is making a little spiral on a piece of paper that the students cut out. Have them cut it out and tape a piece of thread at the very top and hold it over a lamp. But before you do, ask them what they think will happen and why. And then actually hold it over the lamp and see what happens. We're confronted with problems like this in everyday life. Not only do we have to make a prediction as to what we think will happen, but many times we have to go ahead and do the experiment to see if our prediction was correct. Now we're going to do a science activity that's going to tie all of these skills together.
Have you ever seen one of these before? This is called a Bugs Copter, and it comes from a Science and Children magazine article. It's definitely one of my favorite experiments. Why? Because it takes a student throughout the whole scientific process, from making observations, to controlling variables, to formulating conclusions, even to inventing, as you'll see. We start by giving them two Bugs Copters. Let them color them in. Let them cut them out. Make sure that the two are very different from each other. Here we have long ears, wide ears, and short ears, and short body. Have your students experiment with them. Folding the ears crisply across the top and putting a paper clip in the bottom, they drop them off a chair and watch them twirl to the ground. And they make comparisons. Which one twirls the fastest? Which one falls the fastest? Then you get them back to their seats. And you ask them how these two were different. And you're going to get all kinds of answers because there's all kinds of things that are different about them. We're talking about variables. How can we compare this one to this one with all these differences? We really can't. So you want to go from here to this little activity, two different balls. And you say, if I let go of these balls at the same time, which one will bounce the highest? And let them guess. They might guess the blue one. So you go and you throw the tennis ball down and they say, ah, you cheated. You've manipulated one of the variables to change your results. And they say, okay, you can't throw one down. So you go, okay, and you do this. You've let one go at a higher level and you've done it again and they get you for that. So you say, okay, let's do it. Hold them together. They say, hold them together and drop them together at the same time. You can't throw one down. But you make sure that the blue one hits this dishcloth and you get this effect. So in fact, you're showing them that if you can change more than one variable, you can't make comparisons between two things. The variables all have to stay the same except for one. You can only change one variable at a time. Now we want to go back to our bugs copters. We want to ask our students, what things can we change to affect the rate at which it falls? Well, you can change the wing width. You can change the length. You can also change the body length and maybe even the number of paper clips. But as we drop them, we need to have a reference standard, something we can always compare them to. So you should have them make one of these super bugs and have them all use the same standard so they're all making the same comparisons. This particular bugs copter has ears that are one and a half inches across, four inches down, and the body's about three inches down, and this little chin area is about three quarters of an inch. Whenever they make a measurement, they always drop their test sample, their test bugs copter like this one, at the same time as super bugs to see whether it hits the ground sooner than superbugs, later than superbugs, or at the same time. And then they record the data. As a result of this experiment, you'll see that we're keeping the variables, everything the same except for one, the width of the ears. And they will come up with a conclusion as to how the width of the ear affects the speed at which it hits the ground. After you get your students to make experiments like that, then you want to get them all together as a class and get the consensus because maybe not all the students have the right data. And you might tell them this, that even though they don't agree with the rest of the class, the answers they got are correct for them because that's their scientific data. That's what they observed. And in science, there really is no wrong answer. It's what you observe. And that's an important point to bring out. Once you get this consensus, have them go on and test another variable, like the length of the wing. How does that affect the rate at which the bug's copter falls? And as a result of all these little mini experiments, the students will start to develop a picture of the perfect bug's copter, the one that'll stay in the air the longest. Now we're ready for the invention. Tell them the following day in class, you're gonna have a bug's copter contest and give them some dimensions that they have to work within, like you can only use a certain piece of paper at this particular size. And then have them go home and design their own and try and design the bugs copter that'll stay in the air the longest. And then the next day in class, see whose bugs copter wins.